as part of the analytical techniques that we're going to see, uh, we have the NMR uh, spectroscopy that we're going to discuss. Uh, but first of all, we want to discuss the unit of sat on saturation, basically is telling us this number and how many double bonds we have for the uh, structure. So when we have a structure, we need to see if um, the molecular formula has any halogen or has any nitrogen or oxygen involved. <clears throat> Depends on the atoms that we have. If, for example, if we have one halogen, we need to add one hydrogen in the calculation. If we have a nitrogen, we need to subtract one hydrogen. And if we have an oxygen, we just use the amount of hydrogen that is in the uh, regular formula. So the formula that we're going to use is depends on the uh, degree of unsaturation. So we need to make sure <clears throat> we have the formula for the, um, for the compound that we're going to analyze. And we're going to find how many effective hydrogens we have the effective hydrogen, it will depend if we have an halogen or nitrogen. So basically it will be the amount of hydrogens that we have present um, in the formula. And then we're going to do uh, the um, amount of hydrogen that is saturated if we're going to use the formula for the alkane, so which is the uh, amount of carbons, um, for the hydrogen, it will be two times the amount of carbons plus two, okay? So when we use the formula, we're going to subtract these two numbers and divide it by two, and depends if that number for the unsaturation is more than four, we can see that we have um, an aromatic ring present, or <clears throat> it is less than four, we can see how many double bonds we have, okay? So for example, <clears throat> we have here um, some formulas. This is a pentane uh, oxide, okay? Um, in this case, we have two oxygens. So we only want to see how many hydrogens we have in the real formula. So because hydrogen is not making any difference, we just assume that we only have eight uh, hydrogens as uh, effective. And then we use the saturated amount based on the amount of carbon. So we're going to use four times two plus two, it will be 10, okay, for the saturated hydrogens. Then we plot in the uh, equation and we find that we only have one double bond in the formula, okay? That it can happen that this kind of, form, uh, of compound has a carbon double bond oxygen, okay? So it's, it's one example. Um, here we have the second example. We have a chlorine present, which is an halogen. And for the halogen, we need to subtract <clears throat> the amount of, um, I mean, we need to add the amount of hydrogens for each uh, halogen that we have. So the real formula, we have only four hydrogens, but because we have two chlorines, we only need to add two hydrogens more to the effective. So that's why we have uh, effective six hydrogens. And then we are going to use the saturated formula, which is the amount of carbon times two plus two. So we get the saturated hydrogen as a 14. And then when we do the double bond, uh, for saturation, we find that basically we have uh, a double bond equivalency of four. So this structure, it can happen that we have a ring, um, benzene ring on it, okay? So follow that, we can estimate the amount of uh, double bonds <clears throat> to use later in the uh, identification for the uh, different um, uh, structures, okay? For the NMR, we have two different um, charts. One is for the uh, proton that is uh, detected, which is the hydrogen, 
okay? Then what goes from zero to almost 14 or 13 in the uh, chemical shift. So basically we have here in the bottom the chemical shift that depends basically on how, uh, how is that atom that has higher electronegativity affecting the other um, bondings in the um, system. So basically for the NMR, we will see all the protons that we have in the samples, but the only thing is that depends on which one is your atom in the neighbor. So if you're looking on certain um, atom that is detected in this case for this kind of uh, hydrogen here, we need to see what is next to that carbon in order to see how it's going to be affected. So usually the, um, in the structure, if we have oxygens, I mean, if we have halogens, you will see that those chemical shifts uh, signals, it will be basically pulling back to the downfield, which is basically increasing the chemical shift number because it's getting more uh, polar, more electronegative, that kind of um, molecule, okay? Uh, also, in the case that we only have carbons and hydrogens, we will find basically that this molecule, it will have most of their uh, signals or peaks, it will be detected in the area for the up field, which is the uh, lower uh, value for the chemical shift or PBMs in this case, okay? <clears throat> and we have a chart that basically depends on the uh, different uh, functional groups with their protons, which is in this case, the hydrogens, the one that is detected, they going to have some um, signals showing in the uh, spectra or the graph, okay? Another thing that is very, very important, and let me go back, is how we can basically look in on their different molecules. So in the area that we have between zero to almost four or closely five chemical shift in PPM, so we will have all the alkenes, uh, al al alkene that has the double bond, triple bond, the alcohols, the amino groups. But once we have the uh, molecule that has more than one double bond attached to it, for example, the alkenes, okay? Those are in this range between almost 5.5 to almost eight when we have the aromatic rings and all these double bonds in the molecule. But when we have something more that has uh, higher electronegativity like the oxygen, uh, carbon double bond oxygen, the carbonyl group, we're going to look in the downfield in the area between 8.5 to almost 12 that we can find those molecules. Okay, so depends on the area that we're going to see those um, signals, we're going to see, uh, we can identify the different molecules. Okay, and remember, we only uh, in this uh, graph or this spectra for the HNMR, we only looking for the hydrogens. If for some reason the area or the segment in your molecule doesn't have any hydrogens, it's not going to be showing any signals in that area. So for example, if we have this molecule here that we have the carbonyl, we have four carbons together, then we have the carbonyl and then the CH3, this one is a ketone, is showing all the peaks in the neighbors. So it's showing this peak, which is a uh, primary carbon. Then we have a secondary carbon, secondary carbon, secondary carbon. And then the CH3, which is the methyl group, is a, a primary carbon, is showing those in the spectra. But the carbonyl, which is the carbon double bond oxygen, is not shown. This is because 
you don't have any hydrogens in that fragment, okay? <clears throat> and also what you have next to it, you need to see which segment basically you can identify. So in this area, we will have five different peaks because this one, I mean the A, for this methyl group is very far away for the carbonyl compared to this methyl group, which is next to the carbonyl. So this one you will see because it's more closer to the carbonyl group, it will be showing a peak very uh, more to the uh, left area in the, the downfield because it's getting uh, attracted by this uh, polar area in the molecule. Okay, same thing happened with the CH2 here, which is a secondary carbon, and the other two secondary carbons like uh, CH2 here and this other CH2. Because this CH2, which is the letter B, is very far away compared to this carbonyl group. This one, it will be showing more to the upfield, to the right side, very, very close to that area between one ppm because you have the carbonyl very uh, far away compared to this one that is the CH2 letter D, which has next to it the carbonyl group. Okay, so that's why we're going to see a different peaks um, and this uh, molecule doesn't have a symmetry. Okay, so for example, we are, I uh, have another one that is a ketone too. So we have a ketone here. The only thing is that the methyl group, uh, the carbonyl group is exactly in the middle. In that case, we're going to see that it's a symmetric um, molecule that we can basically uh, bend it exactly in the carbonyl area. And we will have a, a two um, <clears throat> secondary carbons that are basically next to the carbonyl. So that's why they can show only one signal in that area, okay? And then we have a methyl group and a methyl group, okay? So that's why this guy on the back, I mean, in the bottom, they only show two peaks, but we need to look on those peaks, how is the multiplicity uh, for those, okay? So for example, here, uh, we have, uh, this is an aldehyde. In this aldehyde, <clears throat> we're going to have some kind of symmetry in this uh, molecule because we can basically bend it exactly in the middle. So this CH2 and this CH2 is kind of similar because it's next to the carbonyl. And the same thing happened here with the uh, CH2 and CH2 in the B area, okay? Compared to the C, the C is the one that is more far away. So that's why it's showing a different peak, okay? This carbon in the carbonyl is not showing any peak because you only have a carbon, double bond oxygen. Needs to have a hydrogen on it, okay? Well, another thing that we need to uh, basically look for those is <clears throat> basically the relationship where they are going to uh, show, okay? So for example, we have here a benzene ring, okay? And we have an alkyl group that has a bromine on it, okay? The bromine is an halogen and that halogen, it will make some kind of difference because it's getting more closer to the fluorine in the periodic table. So it's more electronegativity, okay? So looking at the uh, aromatic ring, when we try to correlate with our correlation chart in the bottom, so I, I just put one on top of the other one, I have my benzene ring here, okay? And whatever substituent that I have, it will be basically showing that has any, um, hydrogens and carbon alkyl groups in that area. So I will have for this benzene at least one area that I know it would be more than 5.5 because it's an aromatic. 
And when you look in your spectra, you have one peak that is telling you that is showing that signal, okay? And it's more than six in the PPM area. So it's more to the uh, downfield, okay? Um, another thing that we need to look is the value here that is telling you the five hydrogen. So basically it's telling you how many hydrogens is in that aromatic ring that is attaching. So that in that case is basically telling you the integer or the integrity uh, for looking and how many hydrogen you have present, okay? So this signal is showing five hydrogens is more than five. So basically it's an aromatic ring. So I'm assuming, okay, aromatic ring is five hydrogens. So I need to have five hydrogens and then one in the double bond for the benzene ring needs to be attached to something. What is to be attached? Well, I have all these three other signals that I need to analyze, okay? So now analyzing the other area. So we're going here in the upfield, which is the lower value for the PBM, we need to see what we are looking at, okay? We need to zoom a little bit here so we can see those. And we try to use the correlation chart in order to determine <clears throat> which one belongs to which, okay? I know that uh, in this area between one and two, one and two, it can be, a CH3 that are terminal. So basically it's a primary carbon or it can be uh, alcohol or an amine, okay? In my molecule, I don't have any oxygens or I don't have any nitrogen. So I just basically um, discard that idea. So I keep only the idea about the terminal carbon, okay? Because it's the range that is showing in my correlation chart. Okay, so in that case, I just assuming this one needs to be a CH3. Then I look for the integer that is telling me that value that is telling me 3H. So that carbon has three protons in that area. So those protons is the hydrogens. So I know that this one is a CH3. Now I'm looking for the other two, okay? And the other two, one is in the range around three or 3.1. And then the other one is like 4.4 to 4.5, okay? 4 to 4.5, and you will see that is so many uh, peaks in that area, okay? Um, or say multiplicity or splitting, okay? In here, we have few of them, but not all of that like in the other one. In the PPM 3 or 3.1, we just uh, look it and see what is uh, corresponding. So it can be an alcohol or amino, but because I don't have those, oxygen or nitrogen is discarded. So then I go back, 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 back here, and I have a carbon next to an halogen, okay? Or it can be a secondary carbon, okay? Next to the carbonyl, or it can be a secondary carbon uh, with a single, okay? It can be any of those. What happened? That in that case, because I have my um, benzene ring, that one with the benzene ring, the benzene ring is having three double bonds. So basically it's pulling more to the um, left area based on the electronegativity, that signal. So basically this signal needs to be more closer to the one, but it's pulling that more out to the downfield, okay? Then looking at, and, and it's a CH2 because it's telling me the integrity is 2H. Then I have the uh, signal that is four between four to four point five. When I go down, 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 
is in the area for the um, allergens. Okay, that is in, the, in that range. So um, I know I have one allergen. I don't know where it is basically attached, but uh, based on my integer that I have, um, is telling me that it's only one H, okay? So um, to be specific, needs to be completely saturated. So in that case, needs to be attached the broma, okay? Then looking, <clears throat> and in this case, let me do another so because we want to look and how many um, peaks or multiplicity or splitting we have in the signal. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, we have six. One, two, three, four, five. and six, okay. So for this guy, we have six peaks or multiplicities um, signals, okay, for this area. That what is telling me is the um, hydrogens that my carbon dot is in the right position and in the left position they have in total, okay. That is splitting is telling me N plus N minus one, okay? It will be the amount of hydrogens that I have. So for example, if I'm sitting here, okay? Look at my pointer. I'm sitting in this CH with the bromine. The carbon that is my neighbor is this guy, which is, which is a CH2. So I have two hydrogens. And then the one that is my other neighbor has three hydrogens. So in total, I have two plus three, it will be five plus one, it will be the amount of splittings that I will have in that signal, okay? Some books they call splittings or some books they call multiplicity. So it depends on the book that you're using, um, but it will be the amount of peaks in this area for the PPM, okay? Same thing happened here. In this case, <clears throat> we only have, uh, we only have two peaks, okay? It looks like three, but it's because it's, the resolution is not so good. So you have one and two. Then you see in here, this guy doesn't have any hydrogen because it has double bond, this bond, and it's the other one. So basically you only have uh, for a carbon, uh, four different uh, electrons for donor and, and sharing, right? So, that's why we only uh, need to have four different uh, bondings, okay? So this one doesn't have any hydrogens, but the next carbon has one hydrogen and one allergen, okay? And counting the splitting needs to be the hydrogen that has your neighbor, okay? Because this one doesn't have, this one has, is only one plus one needs to be two, the amount of peaks in the splitting area or multiplicity, okay? When we're looking on this other guy here, it's the same thing. We are looking only on two peaks, okay? Even that it looks like um, maybe two here and two here, this is the bad resolution. Uh, when you're sitting here, you don't have only your neighbor to the left. You don't have any other neighbors. So. This guy only has one hydrogen plus one, it will be two. So that is the amount of splitting or signal that you will see in this area for the PPM related to the CH3, okay? If for some reason we are basically um, looking on the numbers, just to uh, summarize, when you see those H on top is the integration value or the integer. If the peaks are in the area below 5 ppm, you usually have alkanes or alkenes 
in that area, okay? And depends on the value that if it is a 3H, you assume that it can be a CH3. But if you have a 2H, you need to be very careful because if it's a signal that has multiple, um, I mean, has multiplicity or splitting multiple peaks, it can be a CH2, but it is only a single peak is an amino group, okay? <clears throat> and it's an NH2. When you have one hydrogen, in the hydrogen, uh, for the integration, you can have a CH alone. When you have multiplicity of several peaks in the same area, or if you only have one single peak, it can be an alcohol or amino, okay? And or it is the case, for example, it can be an alcohol or amino, like here, okay? Now, when you go in a higher or higher value for the chemical shift or downfill area, which is the aromatics that we can basically find over there, if you have a 4 H, it's telling you that you have a ring structure and you have only four hydrogens attached, you need to have two substituents or alkyl groups attached to the benzene ring. But if you have a 5 H, you will have basically an aromatic ring that only has one substituent, okay? Um, here, I have uh, the same example. I just go over, um, the same problem again, okay? So basically, 5H is telling me this benzene ring, and here it can be attached that area. For my substituent, in this case, my substituent is the other three signals that I have here, and if I need to basically identify each of them, remember, the integers is basically telling me how many hydrogens I have, and it's below five, so basically it's an alkyl, a uh, substituent that has multiple carbons on it, okay? But what is what you're looking basically is for the products, okay? So 3H, you have a CH3. 2H, you can have a CH2, or depends in our case, um, <clears throat> that 2H, it is a single uh, peak, you can have an amino group okay, which is a primary amino, but in this case, you don't have a single peak, you have two peaks in there. So basically it's a CH2. And in the one H, it's a CH, but uh, remember, if you have multiple splittings or you have multiplicity, it needs to be a CH. But if you don't have that multiplicity and it's a single peak, please be careful because it can be an alcohol or a secondary amino, okay? Um, here, we have another explanation about the multiplicity. It's like I tell you, I mean, if you're sitting exactly in the middle, let me go down. If you're sitting here, please look on your neighbors to the right and to the left and see how many hydrogens you have. Then with the amount of hydrogens, you need to add one in order to see how many peaks or multiple splittings you have in that signal, okay? And here is a summary for you. Okay. I mean, they go um, explaining that, okay? So very important in how we solve these kind of problems for the NMR in the proton area or the hydrogen area. We need to find the double bonds in the molecular formula. They then look on the in identifying the pieces based on the values for the integration that they give us. So those numbers on the top, for example, um, those numbers on the top like these ones, okay, are very important. Then, you need to find basically those pieces based on the integration. And after that, what I will 
like to recommend is using the splitting or multiplicity and see which one uh, this carbon, how many neighbors hydrogens they have, and then try to map it out the different uh, fragments and then put it together, okay? Um, so we have another example here. This is more straightforward. We have the uh, formula, okay, for the uh, molecule. And we have 2H, 3H, 2H, 3H. The good thing about this is all below 3 ppm. So basically this is an alkyl group that it can happen that has an oxygen and that oxygen, it can be an alcohol or it can be a carbonyl group, okay? So the first thing that we need to find is if they have double bonds. If they have double bonds, it can happen that the double bond is in the carbon with the oxygen, okay? Because it's not completely saturated. So see how many carbons we have and the amount of hydrogens is not exactly the double. So that's why I say it's not completely saturated, okay? So when we look on the um, on saturation value or double bond equivalency, which is the equation, we need to see how many hydrogens we have in the effective and how many hydrogens we have it is saturated. And because we have one oxygen, the, um, the equation keeps like that. <clears throat> okay, it's not any change to subtraction or addition in the hydrogen for the effective. And then when we do the calculations, we find that we have one double bond, okay? Um, so I'm expecting that that double bond, it can happen that is in the carbon with the oxygen. But I'm just assuming something that we can corroborate with the spectra, okay? So we have this guy here, which, which is a CH3, okay? Because my integer, it tells me 3H, automatically CH3. Then I have another one here is higher in the um, downfield, okay, it has higher PPM value compared to the first one. So this guy needs to be more closer to the oxygen, okay? But it only has one, one peak. I will look later for that, but immediately I need to look on the 3H, okay? 3H is another CH3. Then I have two other signals, which is this guy and this guy. And this guy has the 2H, is a CH2, and this guy is a CH2. Now, I have those, but I have the formula. So I, what I can do is say, okay, one, two, three, four carbons. And when I'm subtracting those four carbons with the three, six, 10 hydrogens, I'm just keeping at, they, they only give me carbon and oxygen alone, okay? So I'm subtracting what I have. What I have in my pieces is a CH2, CH3, CH2, CH3. So I'm subtracting those. And what is left is carbon with oxygen. Let me go to the other slide, okay? So what I have is a carbon with oxygen when I do the subtraction. And I know that I have a double bond, okay? So basically I look and there is where I find that that carbon has the double bond, okay? But now that I have the different pieces, I need to do the different structures, okay? I can put together that, I mean, CH3, CH3, I mean, it can be one on the front, then one in the back, and then using the two CH2s in the middle and then somehow put the carbonyl group in between, okay? Making a ketone. Or I can do, <clears throat> put in the CH3, CH2, then the carbonyl group and then the CH2 and the CH3. So depends on the, um, ketone that I want to form, it is a, a, a symmetric ketone or not, 
okay? So we have several possibilities. So we can have something that is symmetric, okay? And in that case, it will show me only two peaks because I, if I have the carbonyl in the middle, remember these two guys is showing at the same area and these two guys is showing at the same area which is not possible based in our spectra. Then if I put CH3, CH2, CH2, and then at the end, I put the CH3 after the carbonyl, in that case, it will show me four peaks because they have a different uh, electronegativities uh, induction based on the uh, location for the carbonyl group. Okay, so in that case, that's what I recommend to put together the, um, the drawing. Or let me go back. We can estimate the amount of hydrogens that each of them has as a name. Okay, so for example, here, if we're going to do a draw, a draw so we have CH3, okay. This CH3, which is this one, I know I have one, two, three, okay? Three is the amount of uh, N plus one. So the amount of hydrogen needs to be two hydrogens, okay? In my name, okay? Then this guy, which is a CH3, only have one peak. So N plus one, it will be one. So N or the amount of hydrogen needs to be zero, okay? So you have zero hydrogen. This one looks like it's the terminal, okay? And in between, I have these two and these two, I have one, two, three, so it will be three minus one, two hydrogens in the neighbor because, uh, okay, I have three minus one to know the amount of hydrogens in the neighborhood. And this guy has one, two, three, four, okay, uh, five, and six. So it's six, the N plus one. So in total needs to be five hydrogens, okay? Because it's the amount of in the neighbor, okay? So this guy, let's say this CH3 is at the end. I know I need to have the carbonyl group, okay? And then the next one needs to have, I mean, this guy here, it will be my CH3. And they need to have a CH2 next to it because it only has two hydrogens in their neighbor. So this CH3 is this guy, okay? This CH2 is I'm sorry about that. Is this guy because you have another CH2 in the middle, okay, before the carbonyl group. So this guy has three hydrogens plus two, it would be five. And then this guy is this one, okay? Because this guy, when you look, you have on one side the carbonyl group which doesn't have any hydrogens. And then the next one to the left, they have only two hydrogens, okay? And then the final, which is my CH3, which is this from here, okay? So when I look on the multiplicity or the splitting, remember what it tells you is the amount of hydrogens that you can have in your neighbors, carbons. Okay, and you need to subtract one because the formula is N plus one, okay? So when you're looking, you need to have N plus one splitting or multiplicity peaks in that signal, okay?
okay? Which is the amount of signals that you see here. And then you need to subtract one and it tells you the amount of hydrogens, okay? I think I cover most of that, the area. Let me uh, look at the end of this problem so we can basically find all the information, okay? So the chemical shift, that's the possibility that is correct. So basically A, it would be the one that has two hydrogens adjacent or in the vesinal carbons. Uh, B has five uh, hydrogens in the vesinal carbon, which has six peaks in that signal. And then C, you have three peaks in that signal, which is meaning that you have two adjacent uh, hydrogens in the, uh, the next carbons or the vesinal carbons. And D, it tells you that you don't have anything because um, it's only one peak and your neighbor is the carbon, okay? So when you look on that, you will have uh, basically a spectrum that C is this guy, D is this guy, B is this guy, and then A is this guy. Okay. So basically that um, cover the uh, HNMR spectrum. Another resource that you can use is using the chapter 14. The chapter 14, let me um, show you the information. When you have the chapter 14, uh, and let me um, do here. This is the PowerPoint that is supplied by the uh, uh, house editor. In, from Pinson, um, from the uh, outer, which is the Paula Burkanis. Uh, she made an assumption and she explained how they basically, how the equipment works. So you need to apply a magnetic field. And basically what is happening is that those spins uh, in the nucleus is going to be aligned once you apply that magnetic field. Initially, you will have all those spin is rotating and it's moving, okay? But once you apply the magnetic field at that kind of frequency, they going to align depends on the, uh, on the magnetic field. Once it will be in the up field and other ones it will be down field. So depends on that, they going to be aligned. And you can basically um, apply that energy, okay? So depends on that, depends on the magnetic field and the strength for that magnetic field, you will see uh, the different spins, okay? So basically if the energy increase, you will see those. That is the theory behind that, okay? And the type of uh, equipment that we use for this kind of analysis is looking something like that you will have a big machine. This is what you will see inside of the machine, okay? And basically the media around the machine is um, liquid nitrogen, okay? And you have a very um, big magnet and you have that coil that is basically irradiating that radio frequency in order to let, um, those molecules vibrate, okay? And once you apply that magnetic field, they are going to be aligned, okay? And the sample you put here, the, the sample is not being destroyed. So basically you can recover your sample back again. Um, they are going to be detected with the amplifier and you will see the spectra basically in a computer uh, in order to see those images, okay? Um, depends on how they basically made that um, detection based on the frequency you can see in the downfield, those on the shield nuclei would basically get very uh, effective in the magnetic field. So they will need to have a higher frequency to get that signal detected. 
or we can have uh, a smaller effective magnetic field that you don't see uh, a high frequency. It needs to be a lower frequency that you can see those detections, okay? It's in the off field. And the, the nuclei is the shield, okay? It's, it's shield. Um, so when we look on them, we will have the different signals. Um, And the chemical shift is basically that value in PPM in how far is the signal for a reference compound. In the reference compound, we use a solvent that is basically, um, which is the reference value starts on zero PPM, okay? We usually use the TMS, which is the tetrametric delay. Then we're going to see that um, the signal, okay? In that case, we have a different frequency. So the frequency is increasing. We have the signal for the solvent, okay? Or the reference, and then we have the other two, okay? So we can have those values on charts, or we can have the correlation chart. That's why I want to show you this area for the chapter 14 in your test book. You can find those uh, chemical shift tables. So we have the appendix or we have uh, in the chapter 14, or we can use the correlation chart, okay? Which is basically telling you the um, highlighted hydrogen is the protons that is getting detected. See that it needs to be attached to a carbon or an oxygen to be detected or a nitrogen, okay, to be detected. And depends on the uh, carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen, you will see that is that inference or affecting basically the value in the chemical shift, okay? The most general table is this one that depends if you have carboxylic acid or carbonyl, they're going to be in this area. If you have an aromatic, it's going to be in this area, or if you have double bonds, it's in this area, but not all of them, okay? Depends if you have a carbonyl with a carbon next to it, you will have this area here, and when you have allergens, it's between 2.5 and 4.5, okay? And also the amino groups. Okay. So this is another um, resource for the HMMR so we can consider and use for the identification, okay? So another thing that we're going to also consider after that, is when we are doing the analysis for the carbon NMR. <clears throat> in the carbon NMR, it's kind of the similar, um, the similar theory behind. The only thing is that the chemical shift is most, most higher because uh, the carbon is not like the proton that the molecular weight is very low compared to the carbon. Carbon you have, um, a molecular weight of 12 or 13 in order to see that. And the other thing is that uh, depends on the detector. The detector only detects the carbon specifically. So if you want to use an MR for the carbon, you need to have a special detector. You cannot use the same uh, NMR for the proton, which is for hydrogen, okay? Um, so based on what we have attached the carbon, now in this case, we are looking on the carbon. So depends on where is next to the carbon, we're going to have that, the same uh, relationship for electronegativity. If we have double bond, if we have oxygen, if we have halogen, if we have uh, nitrogen on it, they can be pushed more to the downfield compared to the off field, when you have only carbon attached to hydrogen, 
and it's next to one other carbon, you can have basically in the upfield here below the 50 ppm. But when you have double bonds or you have triple bonds, it's increasing that value, okay? Or if you have aromatics, which is the case for allylic or vinylic, and you have benzene rings, they go in the range more than 100 ppm to close to uh, 170, okay? Then if we have the carbonyl group, which is the carbon with the double bond, then you make a more uh, electronegativity. That molecule, they go in the range for the 200 ppm, okay? So depends on your correlation chart, you can use the correlation chart or you can use basically uh, a table. In the chapter 14, we have another table for the carbon NMR, similar to the one that we have for the hydrogen. And it goes over there. Okay. here. For the, uh, it's in page uh, or the slide 63, for the carbon NMR, we have similar table. The only thing that now we are basically uh, detecting carbons, okay? Depends on which is the carbon that you are attaching. If it's a terminal carbon, you will see that it's below 50, but it is a secondary or a tertiary carbon, they are going to increase the value in the chemical shift because it's going more to the downfield, okay? If you have double bonds or triple bonds, it's basically going in the 100 area, okay? And if you have carbonyl, they definitely go higher uh, than 150, okay? So we're going to see those uh, chemical shift values that is getting increased or it's getting decreased depends on what is in the neighbor or what is attaching that carbon, okay? Because it's affecting those. We have a general table, depends on the hybridization and when we have sp3, they look basically that hybridization goes from zero to 50 ppm uh, approximately. But when we have sp2 or sp, they going to increase, okay? So when we have triple bonds, they're going to increase the SP. If we have SP2, which we have double bonds on it, the value in the PPMs, we are in the range between the 100 and 150. If we have carbonyls, they definitely go more than 150, okay? Um, going back in the correlation chart, So we want to see how many peaks we basically look. Uh, remember in this case, we are looking for carbons. We are not looking for hydrogens. So when we are looking for carbons, we have, we need to count all the carbons. And what is in the neighbor? So this is a methyl group. This is a CH2. We have a CH2 and we have a CH2. These three CH2s are located one next to each other, but you see what is coming next, which is a carbonyl group, and that carbon double bond oxygen is making more electronegativity, so it's pulling those signals more to the downfield area, and we have a CH2. So in this case, the ketone is not symmetric, so you will see those different peaks for the different carbons. And if you're counting, you're counting carbons. So you will have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in the um, general formula, okay? Which is basically corresponding to the six peaks, okay? But not all are basically showing um, very uh, easy in the spectrum. If you have a symmetric uh, formula or symmetric uh, molecule, which is the case for the second ketone that we have here in the bottom, the thing is that because they can be bended, 
you only see three peaks, okay? Because it's showing the carbon for the carbonyl and it's showing the other, um, I mean, the methyl group terminals and the secondary carbons here, okay? Because you can bend the, uh, and it's symmetric, the molecule, okay? Um, looking on that, we're going to use the different um, facts that we learned in the HNMR. The only thing here is because instead of detecting hydrogens, we are detecting carbons, okay? So we're going to see how it's affecting those, okay? And taking also in consideration that the carbon has an isotope, we will see a very rough line as a noise or the background. So it's basically telling me that it's not a smooth surface in that line. Compared to the HNMR, the HNMR, the probability for the isotope is very, very less compared to that. And also the kind of um, solvent that we're going to use is a solvent that has deuterium in the, uh, in the molecule, okay? Um, based on the uh, peaks, okay, we have certain values here. We have Q, we have T, 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 okay? We have the solvent. We don't need to look on that. And we have S and we have two peaks here, which is one here maximize, okay? Which is one. 27, uh, 125, 127. And then we have another one that is uh, 120, uh, 126, 128, okay? So those, those two peaks or those two signals is this one and these two, okay? So we have one carbon here, which is a D, then we have another D and another D, and then, um, we have those, okay? So in terms of the carbons, if I'm just looking and see how many carbons maybe I can have. Well, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in total, okay? But it's not telling me the whole structure. Why? Because when we are looking here and it's more to the hundred value, Okay, based on my correlation chart is the case for aromatic rings, okay? So we need to be very careful when we're looking on those going back here. Remember, aromatic rings starts in 110 to 170, okay? So we have those ranges for the double bonds in the ring structure. So if we don't have the molecular formula, we need to look carefully for what we have and also for these little letters which is the d the s the t and the q which is basically the integrators or integration in my uh, carbon MMR. okay so for the integration or coupling parameters depends on the book they can call integration very, uh, very uh, kind of similar to the HNMR, or they can uh, call like a coupling, okay? Um, for those parameters that we're going to see in the spectrum, the letters tells me the amount of uh, peaks or the amount of uh, carbons with hydrogens that I have, okay? Q is telling me that it's a CH3. T is telling me that it's a CH2. D is telling me that it's a CH and S is telling me that it's only a carb, okay? So to avoid any um, confusion, just use these letters in order to see to which ones belong, okay? And we're going to differentiate those. So we have one example here, okay? And in that case, uh, those like that. Okay, so I have Q, I have T in this example. Okay, if I'm going to do the drawing Q, 
is a CH3. Here. T is the limit that is a CH2. So I have CH2. One, two, and three. So I have CH2 three times. Okay. And one CH3. Then in the next one, it goes down here. In the next one, it tells me that it's a CH2. I have a CH3 here. This one and this one is a CH2. The only difference, I mean, is the location that we have. So this guy is like around 10, okay? This one is like 25, okay? Then we have this one that is close to 31 or 32, okay? And then we have this guy, which is kind of close to 70, okay? Then we have this guy, which is like kind of 45, okay? So we need to see where is the, those locations in the PPM values or chemical shifts. We have this guy that is like 27, something like that, okay? Then we have this one is like 19. And then we have this one as, as 11, okay? So based on those, ah, and we have, a third one here, okay? So based on those, we have here S is a carbon. Then we have T, which is a CH3. And then we have, uh, sorry, CH2. And then we have Q, which is a CH3 two times. So what I recommend is try to look first for the integers and then the location for the signal. So we can differentiate what is belongs to which one, okay? And we can basically match what is the final spectra or to the corresponding uh, compound, okay? So in that case that we have one, two, three, four, I mean, each of them has four. The only one has the single carbon is this guy. So basically this belongs to this one, okay? If I don't have any other choices because we have the carbonyl and the carbonyl is alone. I mean, the carbon double bond oxygen and it's attached to two other carbons. So it's alone. Then, we have these two guys, and these two guys, one has an OH, and the other one has an amino group. So it depends on what is the location for that OH and the amino, we need to see the different factors, okay? We need to match those with the correlation charts, or try to look in the table and see to which one is the one that belongs to. Okay, definitely CH3 here is the initial one. Okay, then we have uh, CH2, CH2 here, which it can be any of these two or any of these two. Okay, then we have this CH2, which is more to the downfield, but this value is a value of 70. Okay. And this value is a value of 45. So depends on what is coming first based on the electronegativity field, okay? We can look and see to which ones belongs. We can use the correlation chart or we can use the table to see to which one is the range for those, okay? If we are looking on the chart or the table, that goes back to the chapter 14. We have this table, which is step 14.3. 
and we have a value here for the carbon oxygen. Okay. The oxygen needs to be attached to the hydrogen. Okay. So this one is for an alcohol group. And then we have the carbon with the nitrogen. And remember, nitrogen needs to have three um, bondings. Oxygen needs to have two bondings. So that's why I just said, okay, this one is basically attaching to two uh, hydrogens here. The value for the PPM is lower between the 40 to 60. And then the one for the alcohol group is between 50 to 90. So based on those, the one that has higher PPM is the one that has the alcohol. And then the other one is the one that has the amino group, okay? If not, we want to look on the correlation chart. So this guy belongs to this one, okay? Because it has the alcohol and the value, look at that, is 70. Then this value is in the range between 40 to 60, is a little lower, so that's why I just say this one is more for the amino, okay? But if you look on the correlation chart, um, we can corroborate, okay? On the correlation chart. Okay, okay. Here. Okay. In my drawing here, we have carbon with amino. And when you look, let me go more. In here, we want to see uh, it's in this range. Okay carbon with an oxygen and the oxygen next to an alcohol is going more in this area, okay? So it needs to be in there, okay? Um, any questions for this kind of problem? Um, if you have any other questions for this kind of problem, we can look on the uh, chapter 14, directly on the table and look on uh, the different values for the chemical shift. We have also the appendix, which has a, a compendium more larger for the different, uh, the appendix, um, they have uh, different molecules and they have also chemical shift when you have something that has ceramics on it too, okay? So basically this one is um, covered for the carbon NMR. So we need to basically identify the different uh, values using the integers in top and also try to use the correlation chart in order to see the differences, 